Either she homeless or she got problems. That's the only reason why she run to a black man. I like him already. Now you wanna get nuts? Come on! Producer, director, writer, he is the ultimate filmmaker and bona fide foodie. You're listening to The Quintus Factor with Michael J. Arbue. Thank you for coming back. Greetings, hello, and welcome to another episode of The Quiditas Factor. I am your host, Michael J. Arboy. But before we begin, I know I ask this question all the time, and I know you do too. What does that strange word, Quiditas, mean? Adriana, please give them the definition. Quiditas, Latin, the whatness of a thing, the essential nature of something, the quality that makes a thing what it is. That's correct. Quiditas is the oneness or essence of a thing or person. Now, I love reading. I think reading develops the brain and gives you the ability to understand other people. You develop a language when you read and you learn a lot of new words at the same time. One of my favorite quotes is by Arthur George R. R. Martin. He basically says, a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. A man who never reads lives only once. The author I'm going to be interviewing today and an author that I've enjoyed over the years is none other than urban fantasy author Jennifer Estep. She's a New York Times bestseller and she's the author of the Crown of Shards series, the Elemental Assassin series, which is my favorite, as well as the Mythos Academy and many, many more. So let's sit back and enjoy this interview with Jennifer Estep. Hey Jennifer, thank you for joining me on the Quiditas Factor. How are you doing? Pretty good. How about you? I'm good. Thank you. So for those of you who listen to this show, you know, I always like to start with this first question. Like when you were eight or nine years old, did you always want to be a writer slash author? Um, well, my grandma always tells the story. She says that when I was about four or five, that I told her that I was going to write a book one day. And uh, I kind of think she had the reaction that, you know, any grandparent would have in that situation. Kind of like, oh, yeah, that that's nice. Um <laughs> But um, I remember actually when I was um, in middle school, um, we had to fill out one of those like questionnaires. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I think I put writer on that. And of course, you know, I always loved to read. And my mom used to take me to the library just about every week growing up as a kid. And that's how I fell in love with books and reading in the first place. And, uh, you know, it just kind of evolved from there. So I think part of me has really always wanted to be a writer. So let's jump to your college years. Did you study writing or, or anything like that? I majored in English and journalism um, because, like I said, I knew that I wanted to do something writing related. And um, so I, uh, I did a double major in English and journalism. And then after college, I worked for a daily newspaper for about 11 years. Um, and I also got my master's degree in professional communication. So um I've pretty much always been involved in writing in, in one way or another. So tell me about the first book that you wrote. Was it something that was published? <laughs> it was a very, very bad epic fantasy book that will never see the light of day. Um, I wrote it one year during college uh, and it was like so cliche and it was just, it was really bad. Um, but, you know, that sort of... Th I had gotten bitten by the writing bug and uh, I wrote another book after that and another book and another book. And I wrote about seven books over the course of about seven years um, before I wrote Karma Girl, which is the first book in my big time superhero series. And that's the book that got me an agent. And that's the first one that was published in 2007. Wow. Seven books. That's amazing. So you wrote seven books and then you wrote Karma Girl, which basically gave you a big break. Tell me a little bit about that journey. Um, well, the first couple of books that I wrote were epic fantasies. Um, I wrote a cozy murder mystery, like um, no magic, no paranormal elements, nothing like that in it. I wrote like a YA fairy tale story. And you know, all along the way, as I was writing the books, I was querying agents and editors, going to conferences and just, you know, educating myself about writing. And uh, this was like back in the, the 2000s. And back then, you know, paranormal romance was like the really popular genre. And um, I started reading Paranormal Romance, and I went to some conferences and listened to some Paranormal Romance authors speak, and I thought, you know, why don't I try Paranormal Romance? 
And, you know, I had always loved superheroes. Um, you know, growing up, I loved like the old Wonder Woman show with Linda Carter and the old Batman show with Adam West. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of wanted to do just a superhero spoof, something that was light and fun and zany and over the top. And so that was sort of the, uh, the inspiration behind Karma Girl. Well, and that's what I like about your books. When I first discovered you, actually, I was looking for something to listen to, and I actually listened to your audiobooks first. I was taking a trip with my girls, and I fell upon your Mythos Academy YA novels. And what I really liked about them is that it had a female heroine, and uh, it was something that my girls can relate to. So tell me, was that something that you were drawn to that uh, make the hero a female? Um... You know, I've always loved like movies and TV shows and books with a lot of action and adventure in them. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when, as a kid watching Return of the Jedi and uh, at the end, you know, when Luke goes to battle the emperor and, you know, Vader is there. I, and I always kind of wondered why didn't Leia get to be a Jedi and have a lightsaber and go fight the emperor with Luke at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of think that was always in the back of my mind in some sense. So when I started writing my own book, you know, I wrote the kind of books that I wanted to read with the strong heroines who go on the adventures and become the, you know, the, the kick butt warriors and save the day and save their friends. So I think it was, it was a combination of, you know, writing the, um, writing the, the kind of book that I always wanted to read. And then just, you know, kind of, kind of reacting to some of the things I had seen in pop culture over the years too. I should have started with this question first, but I did notice that I love your Southern accent. Where exactly did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in the South. I'm very much a Southern girl. Mm -hmm. uh, I still live in the South. Um, but, you know, because of my books, I've been lucky enough to travel pretty much all over the United States, going to conventions and different book events and visiting libraries. And, um, you know, I've also been to a couple of other countries with my books. I've been to uh, Frankfurt, Germany for the big book festival over there, which was amazing. And uh, I've also been to Canada, too, to Calgary for a book convention. So it's it's been interesting to travel around and, you know, see how many people love books. So I put this question out to some of my listeners, and they wanted to know as uh, aspiring writers themselves, how long does it typically take you to write a book? It kind of depends um, what genre that I'm writing in, you know, um, for one of my Elemental Assassin books, um, those are a little shorter than the epic fantasy books that I'm writing now, my Crown of Shards world. Mm -hmm. um, I usually do several drafts. So if you kind of break it down, it usually takes me about three weeks to do the first draft and then say a month to rewrite and then another month to do copy edits and page proofs and this, that and the other. So my production work on the book is probably anywhere from like six to nine months. Wow. Um, yeah. And it, and I'm also juggling multiple projects at a time. So, you know, it just kind of depends how many deadlines I have and, and what else I have going on, but it's, it's definitely a long involved process. Wow. That's amazing. It takes you three weeks to write a first draft. Isn't a novel typically 90,000 words? Um, well, it's not a very good first draft. <laughs> uh, a lot of people call it um, a vomit draft because you just kind of vomit the words up onto the page. Uh, but when I'm, when I'm first starting out, you know, I try to do about 5,000 words a day. And it's just, you know, to me about getting kind of the, the scenes and the characters down on the page. And then I can go back later. And the second draft is where I really, you know, dig in and rewrite and edit and really turn it into more of a full length book. In a lot of ways, the first draft is really just kind of like a really detailed outline. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the second draft is when is when I go back and make it what I would call a real book, quotation marks. And then the other drafts after that is just about you know, editing and fine tuning and just trying to to make it the best book that I can make it. So, like I said before, I started with the Mythos Academy, and I listened to that series with my girls. But then I found your Elemental Assassin series, and I absolutely am addicted to the series. I can't wait for the next book to come out. I'm I'm obsessed. <laughs> so, what I really like about it is the details in the book and, and the way things are written. And one of the things that uh, came to mind is the way you describe magic and how magic works. Is that a idea that you purely came up with or is it based on other things? Uh, well, sort of, um, I started, I started writing Spider's Bite, the first book in the Assassin series, I want to say back in 2008. 
And again, at the time, urban fantasy was the really popular genre, but a lot of it was vampires and werewolves and witches. And I knew I wanted to do something a little bit different from that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I decided to do more just like straight magic and um, people with powers. And then when I started thinking about that, I thought, okay, I knew that I wanted to do, you know, fire um, and air and stone. And I'm like blanking on the other one, ice right now. <laughs> um, and a lot of people maybe would have done like um, earth or plant magic instead of stone magic. But um, again, you know, I wanted to kind of put my little, my own little twist on it um, and make it a little more unique. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I'll say about world building too, uh, I kind of keep the world building a little bit open ended, at least in the couple first couple of books in the series, because you never know like what kind of an idea might strike you and you might be writing like book three or book four and want to do something really cool with your magic but you've set up so many rules in the first couple of books that you can't do it mm -hmm. um so i i do kind of leave it there is some detail but i also kind of do leave it a little bit open-ended too uh, just to kind of give myself that safety net but yeah i mean i just i knew that i wanted to do people with powers and you know the the elemental fire and ice and air and stone just it just worked out for me. Wow. And I, 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 I'm from New York. So I love the fact that you've interwoven this whole world. And not only is it, you know, where, you know, there are giants and vampires walking around, but it takes place in the South. And I love that the Southern twist that it has with some of the characters. Is that based a little bit, a little bit on your real life or is it just something that, in, that you've enveloped? Well, I, I am from the South, um, so it, it definitely has been, part of it is, you know, based on just growing up in the South and like my family, you know, lives in various places over the South and just seeing like even the regional differences between like Tennessee and North Carolina and Virginia and South Carolina. Um, and also I think there's something really like the South a lot of times has almost like this noir feel to it. Mm -hmm. uh, which I thought worked really well when you're writing about, you know, sort of this dark, gritty, fictional world with um, assassins and everything else that's going on in the books. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I love it. Like, you know, I don't want to give away too much of the books, but I've, I've already told my uh, listeners to check out your books. Um, I love, um, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, there are certain um, scenes in your books where the, like you're, you are killing them with kindness. Is that a, is that a, a thing? <laughs> it is it is totally a thing like when somebody says bless your heart you know it's kind of the cliche of they can they can really like be sympathizing with you or they can like really be you know cutting you down it's just all about the tone and you know bless your heart and you know just it's all about how you say it in the south sometimes and that's what I love about the series, all those little details. I remember um, over the summer last year, uh, we drove the kids to Disney and we're driving to Virginia and we see Ashland, the town of Ashland. And we're like, wow, look, look, there's Ashland from the books. There are actually there are actually several towns in the U.S. called Ashland. And I didn't realize that at the time when I was coming up with the town name, it just kind of popped in my head one day. But I think there's an Ashland, Kentucky and... I think several other states actually have an Ashland in them too. Another thing that I noticed in all your books is that you have this magical way of describing food that makes me, you know, my mouth water. I'm starving by the time I'm, I'm reading the end of the chapter. Uh, so tell me uh, about that style. I mean, are you a cook uh, or a chef? Um, I cook a little bit. I actually, my thing, I like to make dessert. Um, mm. Because if you're going to take the time to cook, you might as well make something sweet, I think, anyway. Um, but I'm, I'm also very much about like easy, simple recipes, you know, um, like taking a cake mix and dressing it up instead of making the whole thing from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do really like to bake, you know, especially around the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, I have my little recipe box of tried and true recipes, you know, that some of them are like family recipes and then just some that I found over the years. And, you know, I also love like the tradition of food. Like my mom makes this um, green jello salad for Thanksgiving every year. And like nothing says Thanksgiving to me like that one dish along. She also makes really, really good um, homemade dressing. And that's the dressing and the, the green salad are like my two favorite things about Thanksgiving. 
But you know, I just, someone pointed out to me several years ago, they were like, even before I think I wrote the first assassin book, they were like, you know, you really, you really can describe food really well. And I thought, yeah, I can. <laughs> and sort of that was like one of those light bulb moments. And then ever since, you know, I always try to put a little bit of food talk in my book somewhere, no matter you know, whether I'm doing a young adult book, um, or the Elemental Assassin series, or even in my Crown of Shards series, the Epic Fantasy, you know, I, I talk about food quite a bit. Yeah, I was going to say, you talk about food in all three of those books, and I, I like it, when I'm reading, when I'm reading that scene, I'm just like, all right, I'm going to have to ask Jennifer, is she going to come up with a cookbook, because I'm dying to try some of these recipes for real. For real. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I get that question a lot. I, I don't have any plans to do a cookbook, um, you know, like, some of the recipes only exist in my imagination, like Fletcher's barbecue sauce. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, barbecue means different things to different people. And I don't think that I could come up with a recipe that would like satisfy everybody, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I just, I kind of like people to picture like their own version of Fletcher's sauce in their minds. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do not have time to do a cookbook, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, if you ever get bored and you decide to write a cookbook, let me know because I'll be the first one to buy it. <laughs> so another question I have and another question that the listeners um, are interested about is tell me about how many books did you write before you became a New York Times bestseller? And tell me about that moment. I think I first hit the New York Times list. I think it was with Spider's Revenge, which is book five in the Elemental Assassin series. And I want to say that one came out in 2012. So I think that was my probably eighth or ninth or maybe even 10th published book. I would have to go back and, and do the math. Um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting. And again, that was kind of publishing has changed so much over the past 10 years. It's just, it's really amazing. Um, you know, the rise of ebooks and audiobooks, especially, and and how all that has impacted the bestseller lists. And it's just uh seems like something new comes along every day in the publishing world. Wow. So tell me about that moment. How did you feel and who told you that you made it onto the list? I was actually um, at a book club meeting um, for several years. I was part of a local book club and, you know, we would meet and talk about writing and things like that. And uh, I was, I was sitting at book club. Um, I think we met at our local Barnes and Noble in the coffee shop and uh, my phone rang and it was my agent. And it, this was about, I want to say like six thirty or seven o'clock on a Wednesday night because that's when the list come out. And she was like, you know, oh, I wanted to tell you, you know, you made the New York Times list. And uh, I just, I kind of remember sitting in the cafe, just kind of like stunned, staring at the phone, thinking, you know, that like all the years of writing and all the hard work, you know, I had finally like achieved one of my goals. So it was, it was a really special moment for me. Wow, that's amazing. So for those who are listening in and who also want to be writers, was it really hard for you to get an agent? It was. Um, like I said, I started back in the in the 2000s, which is really kind of before a lot of stuff was online as far as publishing goes. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember going to the library and getting the old uh, publisher's marketplace kind of a book and, um, you know, flipping through it and seeing what agents represented, you know, paranormal romance and fantasy books and sending them letters and sending them chapters. Um, and, you know, like I said, I wrote seven books over about seven years and I was querying agents with every single book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I got about four or 500 rejections total. I mean, I got a lot of rejections. Um, I used to have a big folder of all the printed ones, but I, I got rid of most of those a long time ago because I just didn't, didn't have room to keep them anymore. But yeah, it definitely didn't happen overnight for me, you know, and I always tell people, if you really love writing and you really want to be published, you know, just keep at it and, you know, keep learning about writing and publishing and getting better. And, you know, eventually, you know, it'll happen for you. So are you still with that agent that took a chance on you or do you have another agent now? Um, I've gone through a couple of agents. I actually, I got an agent, I want to say for the cozy murder mystery that I wrote, but the book didn't sell. So we parted ways. And then I got an agent for Karma Girl mm -hmm. and I was with her for a while, but she eventually, I want to say she got married and left the agency. Um, so I transferred over to another agent and um, I've been with the same agent, I'd say about 12 years now. And for those who are listening at home, can you tell us what exactly does an agent do for you? 
So an agent in a lot of ways is kind of, and I hate to use this word, but it's a good word, um, a gatekeeper um, for traditional publishing, much of which is, is located in New York. Mm -hmm. Basically an agent has contacts with editors at various publishing houses. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they look, the agent looks at your book and they basically determine if they can sell it and which editor and publisher might be interested in it. Um, you know, so if you want to get published by a traditional publishing house, you know, you, you pretty much, I don't want to say you have to have an agent these days, but it's definitely a big, big help because, you know, having an agent is almost like saying that someone has read your book and thinks that, you know, it's ready to be published in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, an, an agent can be a big help. And then when they sell your book too, you know, they negotiate your publishing contract. Um, they can sell things like um, foreign rights and film rights and an agent actually can do quite a bit for your career as an author. Although I will say, you know, you always have to be careful with agents, editors, publishers, with everybody. You know, there are a lot of scams out there um, on the internet when it comes to writing and publishing. So, you know, just be careful and do your due diligence and do your homework. And what does your family think about you being an author? <laughs> Uh, well, my mom always says that she can't write a letter, so she doesn't really know where all the writing came from. Um, but she, like I said before, she has been so supportive. You know, she took me to the library every week when I was a kid, which is how I fell in love with books and reading in the first place. Um, and, you know, she's been to book conferences with me and, you know, so she, she's really been supportive. You know, all of my family has been supportive. Um, my dad actually reads my Elemental Assassin series, and he reads the Crown of Shards epic fantasy series. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a lot of cousins, too. And when I have a new book out, a lot of them will post about it on social media, like, hey, this is my cousin's book. Go buy it. <laughs> so, so that's been really nice. What's one of the most surprising things you've learned while creating your books? I would say that people will focus on things in your book that you never expected, like in a million years. Um, one of the, the things in my book, um, and this is actually the bane of my existence, I would say, is the word toboggan. Mm -hmm. um, because I live in the South, and in the South, toboggan is the word for a winter hat. Mm -hmm. But I have gotten dozens and dozens and dozens of emails over the years where people are like, don't you mean, um, I think it's toque or toque, I can never figure out how to say it. But it's a, it's a northern um, or even a Canadian word, and it means a winter hat, and a toboggan is a sled. And I don't know how many times I've explained to people that, no, in the south, a toboggan is a hat, and a sled is just a sled. So it's, it's really interesting the, the things that people will, like, pick out in your books and kind of focus on. <laughs> so for me, it's, it's toboggan, and I, I have come to hate that word, and I wish I had used another one from the very beginning. <laughs> So you've written well over 20 books. Which one's your favorite? You know, that's always hard for me to answer. Um, you know, each book is different and special in its own way. I'll say that Karma Girl will probably always have a special place in my heart because it was my very first published book. Um, but for me, I usually like the first book in a series the best. Like, I love a good origin story. Mm -hmm. And for me, a lot of times the first book is about, you know, the heroine sort of figuring out her powers and her magic and coming into her own as a person. Um, so, you know, Karma Girl, Spider's Bite, Kill the Queen, you know, those are, those are some of the books that are a little bit more special to me than the other ones. Okay. As an indie filmmaker, I get asked the question all the time, how much of me is in my stories or films? So I have to ask you the same question. Uh, how much of you are in your books? Um, I, I will, I will go with your answer. I'll say, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of me in the books, you know, like with Jen, with the Elemental Assassin series, I love to read. Um, I do like to cook. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people always ask too, if I base characters on people that I know in real life. And I don't usually do that. Um, although I will take like little bits and pieces of characters that I know. Um, for example, my grandma does not like to wear socks. Um, she says that socks make her feet hurt. I, I don't know why, but that's what she says. <laughs> Uh, so in the Elemental Assassin books, Jojo almost never wears socks, and that's kind of based on my grandma. So, you know, I'll, I'll take little, like, character quirks like that, mm -hmm. but, like, most of the characters are not based on real people. Do you interact a lot with your fans? I, well, again, you know, when I first started out, 
was kind of before the rise of social media, but now with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and email, you know, everybody is connected pretty much all the time, especially um, books and authors and readers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm on, I'm on social media every single day talking to people and, um, you know, I try to make my social media sites just kind of fun places for people to come and hang out and talk about books and movies and TV. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I get a lot of positive response from readers, which, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for. It's always cool to know that someone has read and enjoyed my book. And uh, like this year, I've gotten a couple of comments from people saying that, you know, with the, uh, the pandemic and everything that's been going on, that they just needed an escape for a couple of hours from the real world mm -hmm. and that my books were able to provide that to them. And, you know, that's always really a humbling thing to hear. Because writing, it's such a lonely business. I mean, it's just you at your computer for hours and hours and hours on end. So knowing that somebody else out there in the world has actually, you know, read what you wrote, it's, it's really a cool feeling. So that was my next question. I noted that you spend so much time writing and you release so many books a year. When do you find time to do anything else? I mean, I follow you on social media. I think the only thing I saw you doing was uh, watching uh, football. <laughs> Well, I do, I do love football and fantasy football, so that, that is one of my hobbies on the side. Mm -hmm. um, but no, you know, writing is my full-time job, and really, if you're an author, it's like having your own small business, and there's always something to do. You know, even if I'm not writing a book, you know, I'm updating my website or, you know, scheduling social media posts or looking at advertising or, you know, updating my biography online or, or whatever. So there's, there's always something to do and it can be a little overwhelming sometimes, you know, I, I definitely need to find more of a work life balance because especially this year, you know, when everybody's been home so much, it's definitely tended more toward the work side. Mm. Do you have any suggestions that would help me or some of the people listening to how to become a better writer? One thing that I always tell people is to have fun with your writing. And I know that sounds like kind of a weird thing to say because writing is often not very fun at all. <laughs> it's a, it can definitely be a long slog. Um, but what I mean by that is like a lot of people will see whatever the popular genre is right now. Like say zombie books are popular and they'll try to write a zombie book, even though they don't like zombies at all. Um, so I always tell people to have fun with your writing and by that, I mean, you know, don't write a zombie book just because you think that they're popular right now because you won't enjoy writing it and it'll show in the finished book. You know, you want to give yourself the best chance and write the best book possible from the very beginning. So think about like what you like to read, the authors you like to read, the kind of TV shows and movies that you like to watch, the kind of music you like to listen to. Like, what do you like about them? What do you like about the characters and the stories? Do you like a lot of action or do you like a lot of banter? Or do you like magic systems? You know, whatever it is that you like, just think about that and think about your strengths as a writer and, you know, focus on that from the very beginning and you give yourself like a much better foundation and a much better chance to succeed. Wow, that's some great advice. So as you know, you're on the Quiditas factor, and Quiditas means the whatness or essence of a thing or a person. So I usually ask people what's their Quiditas, but to make it easier, I'm going to say, what's your magic power? I would say perseverance, um, because like I said, writing can be a very lonely, solitary journey, and you know, there's there are a lot of good things about it, but there's a lot of bad things about it too. And you just kind of have to take the good with the bad and balance it out and just keep going and persevere through all of it. What is something that people seem to misunderstand about you? Mm. I would say not just for me, but a lot of authors, um, you know, a lot of people pick up a book and an author is just kind of a name on a cover mm -hmm. and they don't seem to understand that there's a real person behind the name. Um, and you know, sometimes that you'll see really negative or even nasty reviews. And I just, I kind of wonder like why people are so negative in that way. Um, because you know, it is an author and if, if you don't like somebody's book, you know, that's perfectly fine. But, you know, I just guess I just want people to respect the time and the energy and the effort that, that all authors put into writing their books. Tell me about somebody who touched your heart and how they changed your life for the better. Uh, again, you know, I would go back to my mom um, and just, you know, 
her taking me to the library, you know, all like, I mean, we went pretty much every single Saturday when I was a kid. And I'm, I'm sure that there were weekends when she had other things to do or, you know, she was tired and maybe didn't want to go, but she took me anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that, you know, I, I was able to become an author and have that inspiration to write. And, you know, here I am like 40, 40 books later. Um, so that's, you know, I, I wouldn't be a writer if it wasn't for my mom. So, um, you know, I will always appreciate that about her, I think, more than just about anything else. Mm. Tell me one thing that writing did for you that you didn't expect. Um, I will say it opened up just a whole new world to me. Like I said earlier, you know, I've traveled all over the U the U.S. with my books. And that's something, you know, when you're sitting at your computer for the first time writing a book, you know, you just want to get it done. You don't really think about what could happen down the road with it. And um, like all the places I've been and all the people I've met, all the people that I interact with online, um, you know, I don't think any of that would have happened if I wasn't a writer. And that's something else that, you know, I'll always be grateful for. Tell me about that moment when you got that first big check from one of the more successful books. Like, how excited were you and what was the first thing you bought? <laughs> well, I, I, I hate to kind of burst the bubble, but, um, you know, most writers don't make a ton of money uh, unless you're like a superstar author. Um, but, um, I do remember I, when I got the first check for Karma Girl and it, you know, it wasn't like a huge amount, but, um, it was like, it was still just amazing that somebody had paid me to write a book about superheroes, which is something that I probably would have done for free. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful every day that, um, that I'm able to make a living writing books because, you know, I, I know that I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. What's the best compliment you've ever received? Hmm. Gosh, that's tough. Um, you know, I get, I get all kinds of letters and you know, some of them are really happy and some of them are really sad. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten emails from people going through cancer for, excuse me, going through cancer or who've lost a loved one or, you know, something, something tragic like that. And, you know, some of those people have said, you know, I needed an escape for a couple of hours and I was just able to lose myself in your book and, and not think about the bad thing that was going on in my life right now. Um, and for me, you know, I think that's one of the best compliments that any writer could get knowing that, you know, someone was like so captivated by your story and your characters that you know it was it offered them an escape for you know a couple of hours and then the other thing too um like people have made me things like based on my books um like charm bracelets and storyboards and things like that and then people have actually gotten tattoos as well like uh jen spider rune several people have gotten that tattoo and that's something else that's all always like really cool to see knowing that you know my characters and my book you know resonated with somebody that much and that's interesting that you should say that because i love the elemental assassin series so much i would love to see this turned into a movie or a series so hollywood if you're listening please you know uh check out jennifer's book i mean jennifer is that something that you would like to see happen I would love, you know, if there was a movie or a TV show, Netflix, I think would be awesome. Like HBO, I think would be really good. Mm -hmm. um, I think a TV show would probably be better for the Assassin series just because there's so many books now and so much, so many characters and so much story. But yeah, and that's something else too. I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, somebody in Hollywood actually has to be interested in your book before it gets turned into a movie or a TV show. Um, my agent always says that it's kind of like being struck by lightning and bitten by a shark at the same time. You know, like it could happen, but it probably won't. Um, but, you know, fingers crossed that maybe it'll happen someday. I definitely think so. I hope so, at least. Has anyone ever optioned one of your books? I've gotten some interest over the years um, from some different people, but it never really ever seems to amount to anything. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when somebody does inquire about the film rights, I refer them to my literary agent and then, you know, they kind of take it from there. But 
you know, so far nothing, nothing has really happened. So outside of writing, what are you curious about right now? Gosh, I don't know. I guess just wonder what other crazy thing is going to happen in 2020 besides, you know, the pandemic and earthquakes and murder hornets and everything else. <laughs> I, I saw I saw a post on Facebook today. I wouldn't be surprised if dinosaurs came back. And it's like, yeah, that's that's a pretty good way to sum up 2020. Um, you know, I'm I'm always curious, like what other people are interested in, what people are reading and writing, and what people are watching on TV. I love like watching something that a friend has watched, and then like talking with them, talking with them about it. Um, like right now, I'm trying to convince one of my writer friends to watch Cursed on Netflix, which I just finished a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, that was a really cool fantasy series um, for people who might be looking for something new to watch. Um, I just I like talking about books and TV and music and writing and and everything like that. Tell me, what is one of the biggest challenges you've had with one of your characters, and how did you overcome it? I will say, um, and this is a little bit spoilery for the Crown of Shard series, um, but there's a villain in that series that I really, really like. And um, you've read my book, so you know what usually happens to the villains at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, but this villain, I just, I found them so interesting that I didn't want to kill them off at the end. Um, and I, I thought about it for a long time and I really struggled with it. And I thought if I don't kill them off, you know, is this kind of, I don't want to say betraying the reader's trust. Um, but you know, if you set somebody up in a villain in a fantasy book, they usually die at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really, I thought about that for a long time and I thought, no, I thought I'm going to keep this villain around just because they are so interesting. And I think there's so much more story to be told with them. Um, so that's something that I kind of had, had struggled with a little bit recently. I read the book that you're talking about, and it threw me for a loop, and now I can't wait to see what happens. I, it was a fantastic twist. I thought that was one of the better twists that I had done in a while. So that brings me to my next question. The Elemental series is 18 books long. You're working on number 19. How in God's earth do you keep everything straight? Um, I actually kind of cheat with that. Um, like... When you have a traditionally published book, um, you know, after the copy edit stage, most of the copy editors will do um, what they call a style sheet. And it's just basically kind of like, um, almost like a series Bible for your book. It usually lists all the character names and their descriptions and the location names and all that. Uh, so I find that really helpful to kind of keep everything straight. And then, you know, if I have a question too, I'll just, I'll go back and flip through one of the books and see what I did. Um, and honestly, like, I read and reread the books so many times during the production process. I, I like have some of like the most recent ones. I feel like I still have memorized <laughs> to some extent. Um, so it, it's pretty easy for me to keep up with things. Although, you know, I am kind of bad about wanting to use a character name and then I'll look at the style sheet and be like, Oh no, I used that name like six books ago. I can't use it again now. <laughs> This next question is really more for for me than the audience because I'm a little bit of a fanboy with this question. But I noticed that with your stories, the heroine's name either starts with J or G. Is that something you did on purpose? You know, it kind of is. Um, and it's a kind of a funny story. Um, so I came up with Jen first. And then I had always really liked the name um, Gwen, Gwendolyn from Mythos Academy. So I used those two. And then I thought, you know, that's two G names. You know, I should do something else. And then um, one of my author friends pointed out that I also use a lot of M names um, for the villains, like Mab in the Elemental Assassin series. And she was like, you know, maybe G and M names are your good luck charms. Mm. So now it's like, I kind of purposely use the G and the M names. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just because I, I think that's a cool way to look at it. Um, yeah. Although I'm, I can imagine some people might be getting tired of it. So, you know, I have put some other names in there, like Evie with the Crown of Shards series and some of the villains. But yeah, I'll probably, probably keep using at least some G and M names. Okay, so let's see. Are there any funny stories or moments when you're writing a book that you'd like to tell the audience about? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, it's always kind of interesting what comes up. Um, because I'm pretty much a pantser and 
what that means is you know, kind of flying by the seat of your pants. I don't do like a lot of outlines or storyboards or things like that. I just, I think about, since I write in first person, I think about the heroine and her magic and how she can use it to defeat the bad guys. And I think about the big turning points in the story and then I just kind of sit down and start writing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that works out pretty well and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I remember there have been some cases like when I've been writing and, you know, I thought like I was going to kill a character off or they were going to do this thing or whatever. And then um, something else happens and it just like an idea will just pop in my head while I'm writing and it just completely changes like what I do with that character. Um, like, for example, one example would be Hugh Tucker in the Elemental Assassin series. Mm -hmm. And again, this is a little bit of a spoiler for the later books in the series. But I kind of thought at first that he was just going to be like a, a one book villain. And I was just going to, you know, kill him off as I have killed off many villains in the assassin books. But then I thought, you know, what if there's more to his story? And, you know, so I started thinking about that and I started writing more about him and I started liking him more and more. <laughs> um, so it, it's always kind of interesting sort of the the things that your subconscious will come up with as you're writing mm -hmm. um and and how those things get reflected in your books mm. so i recently made my wife read the elemental series and one of the things she points out is that she loves your steamy love scenes <laughs> 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 and so I, without getting into too much detail how, how do you come up with them and and like i asked other people who are your fans about and that's that's one of the things that they love about your books well, thank you. And tell your wife, thank you. I'm, I'm glad she's enjoying those. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I actually don't think they're all that steamy compared to some of the other books out there. I think, I think they're pretty mild. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, with me, a lot of it is more about the emotion than the sex. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think with any kind of a scene, whether it's a romantic scene or a fight scene or, you know, whether it's just two characters talking or arguing or whatever, I think like the little details are the things that really make a scene come to life. Um, like if you're writing a fight scene, you know, instead of saying, oh, she stabbed him and he fell down, you know, you could say something like his blood was scarlet on the snow white landscape kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, what the blood smells like or how the air feels or the heaviness of the sword in somebody's hand. And, you know, I think, I think the little details are what really bring the scenes to life and you took the words right out of my mouth because that's what i was just thinking about before you have this talent this unique talent to describe how people are feeling through their smells and their scents and it really paints a picture i really love the way that you do that oh well, thank you yeah. and you know again that's that's another one of those little details because um you know like what somebody's soap smells like or their shampoo or their lip gloss or, or whatever that's just another one of those little sensory details that you can add in there to add a little more depth and emotion to your to your scene what's one common myth about your profession do you like to debunk right now well uh, we mentioned it before the fact that you know all writers make tons of money spoiler alert that is that is not the case <laughs> I, I know a lot of writers who have day jobs and I had a day job myself for many years. Um, I mean, there's so many like things you could debunk about writing. Um, the movie and the film thing is another one. Like if you write a book, you're automatically going to get a movie deal. You know, no, that doesn't happen. Um, and oh, another one too is like, if you write a book, your publisher is going to send you on a book tour. Mm. Yeah. Unless you're like a superstar author, that's probably not going to happen. And it's probably not going to happen for anybody this year, <laughs> sadly <laughs> to say, yeah. because of the pandemic. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting that the things that people will will ask you or will assume about writers. Um, like I remember at one of our family reunions, one of my cousins came up to me and said, "Oh, you just sit at home and write all day." And I was kind of like, "Well, yeah, I guess technically I do, but I also do you know all these other things." Um, accounting and taxes and this that and the other um, but I just I thought it was interesting that like the writing was the only thing that she had focused on um, yeah I just have to attest to those people listening that writing is very very hard 
I kind of did the opposite. I wrote a script and I tried to turn it into a book. And it was probably one of the hardest things I ever did in my life. Because with script writing, you know, you just give a few details and then everything else is visual. Mm -hmm. And having to try to take that and turn it into a book and fill it with detail, it was extremely hard. Now, see, I, I would probably have the opposite problem where, you know, I write these 100,000 word books and then writing a, a script or a screenplay where it's like 120 pages for a 120 minute movie. Yep. It's like, I don't know, it would just be like so much dialogue. And I think I would have a hard time like cutting out all the description and, you know, everything that the characters are feeling and then trying to think about how you still get that across when you have really a limited amount of, of words and space. Right. That's why so many movies, uh, books that are adapted from movies aren't as good, you know, because you can't put the amount of detail that you need to put into uh, uh, a movie that, you know, because the movie can only be so long. That's why, like, when I think about your books, I'm like, I need Netflix or HBO to pick it up because I need that detail. I need the voiceovers. You know, I don't want anything cut out. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I hear that I've been on panels with authors whose their books have been turned into movies or TV shows or whatever. And, you know, they, they've talked about how many complaints that they get from readers because this was left out or that was left out or, or it's not the same as the book. And I think a lot of people don't realize it's just such a completely different medium in a way. And, you know, it's like, writing for TV or for a movie is different than writing the book and the things that you can focus on. And then also too, like you have to think about the actors that you have available and the budgets and the sets and what you can make and, and like a million different things like that. And it's like, when it's me, I can just sit down and write as many words as I want to. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Um, for the future generations of your family listening to this years from now, is there any wisdom you'd like to pass on to them? I would just say, just for my, my little cousins that are growing up now and just everybody listening, you know, if you have a dream and you want to do something, then follow it and don't listen to the naysayers and people who tell you that you can't do it. Um, I remember some members of my own family, you know, when I told them that I wanted to write books, they were kind of like, yeah, sure. Okay, whatever. And, you know, now that I have written all these books, they're like, oh, so proud of me. And it's kind of like, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so I would just say to anybody, you know, if you want to be a writer or an actor or an artist or whatever you want to do and you have the passion and the desire and the drive to do it, then go for it. If you could have dinner with any three people that are alive, who would it be and why? Ooh, that's always a good question. Um... I will say, first of all, I will say Stan Lee, um, because I'm a huge superhero fan, and I would just love to know how he and, like, Jack Kirby and all the other, like, old school comic book folks, you know, came up with, with all these classic characters that we love right now. Kelly Clarkson, because I love her music, and I just think she would be, like, just a hoot to have dinner with. Uh, she just <laughs> seems so, like, fun and down to earth and bubbly. Chris Evans, because I'm sitting here looking at my, um, collection of Captain America Funkos. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the Captain America movies are my favorite ones in the Marvel universe. So uh, I'll say Chris Evans. Okay. And my final question for today is what does the future hold for Jennifer Eastep? Uh, I am, of course, I'm working on more books. Uh, like I said, I think I've just, I'm up to like 41, I think, that I've written now, although they're not all out yet. Um, my next book is called A Sense of Danger. It will be out Thursday, November 12th um, from Audible Original, so it'll be audiobook only for a couple of months. Wow. And uh, it's basically Spies with Magic, because um, I'm also like a huge James Bond fan, and I just, I love the spy genre, and so I kind of wanted to put my own take on that. And then um, 2021, uh, Last Strand, is the title for Elemental Assassin 19. And I'm hoping to release that one in March of 2021. And then I'm also working on a new trilogy in my Crown of Shards world um, about Gemma Ripley. And it's set about 15 years after the events of Crush the King. And the first book is called Capture the Crown. And that will be out in July of 2021. And then you know, I'm already working on more projects for like 2022. So a writer's work is never done. Jennifer, thank you so much for doing this. Can you take us out? This is Jennifer Estep, and you are listening to The Quiditas Factor. 
Thank you for listening to the Quidditas Factor. I am Michael J. Arboy. Before I let you guys go, please visit my website at www.mikearboy.com. That's M-I-K-E-A-R-B-O-U-E-T dot com. And please uh, check out the Quidditas page and go to my shop and go to Arbor Artifacts and buy a t-shirt that will help keep the show going as well as my wife's Etsy store that is Poem Jewelry Design she makes wonderful jewelry so if you're looking for something for someone please check that out and also if you want to become a patron please by all means uh, check out my patron page I click on the button on the website and become a patron for like a dollar a month or five dollars a month you really help the show going and I'll give you some secret tips and stuff that didn't end up in the um, broadcast Um, little uh, tidbits of knowledge information that you might like please come back next tuesday for an all new episode of the quidditas factor thank you for listening thanks so much for listening to the quidditas factor with michael j arboway we'll catch you next time